Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. It feels good to be back in church, doesn't it? There's something about gathering together as a people and worshiping God in a, in a certain area that, that is far more meaningful than getting on a, a webinar <laughs> and listening to someone preach. But I want to thank everyone that has made um, this worship service possible. I'm not sure who picked up the masks and the, um, what do you call that thing where you point it at someone's head and take their temperature? Thermometer. What is that called? Thermometer. Well, what, what kind of? Like infrared thermometer. Infrared thermometer. So I, I want to thank everyone that has, has been working behind the scenes. Um, uh, at the end of the worship service, we'll probably have a plate in the back if you want to bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord. We're not going to pass the, the plate around, but we're going to give you the opportunity to, uh, to participate through that. Well, before I begin my sermon, I would like to invite you to bow your heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come into your presence this morning. It's so good to be in your house of worship. Lord, we want to thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And Lord, we think about the people that are without work right now. We ask that you would give them wisdom and understanding and, and where they can find a meaningful job to provide for their families. Lord, we want to thank you for keeping us as a church safe from the, the COVID-19 virus. I ask that you would continue to keep us safe. And I want to thank you for everyone that has joined us this morning in person and through um, the YouTube channel that we have on the internet. Lord, I, I feel unworthy to stand before your people, so I ask that you would forgive me of my sins, and I want to claim that one promise again found in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As I present the message that you have put upon my heart to your people, I ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to open up our hearts and minds. And Lord, teach us through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm doing a series on the kingdom of heaven, and as you recall, the first time that we got together, not in person, but through the internet, I had mentioned that Matthew used a phrase 35 times. And what was that phrase? The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. And I asked you, well, what is God's kingdom like? Can we trust God as king? And to understand what kind of king uh, God is, we have to understand, well, what kind of creator was God? What kind of prophet was God? What kind of savior was God? And what kind of high priest is he? And what kind of judge is he? And as you remember, we looked at the creation story found in Genesis chapter 1 through 3. So what kind of creator is God? He's a good creator. He's a loving creator. He's a compassionate creator. He's a creator that cares about his creation. Those that were made in his image. He provided a home for Adam and Eve. He provided entertainment for them, watching the birds fly through the air and the animals rummaging through the forest and the fish jumping out of the bodies of water that were probably in the Garden of Eden. He provided them with taste buds to enjoy the food that they um, part, um, partook of in the garden. And he gave them eyes so that they could see shapes and colors and sizes. He was a good creator and he provided them with companionship, not only with himself, but with the animal kingdom and with someone that looked like themselves. Adam was given a wonderful companion in Eve. So he was a good creator. Well, what kind of prophet was Jesus? Well, Acts 10 verse 38 says, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and helping all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will discover that God was a good prophet. Oh, you lost your, your son, I will raise him to life. You can't see, I will open your eyes. You're hungry, I will feed you. 
You need a friend, I will go to your house. He was a, a good prophet. He was a loving prophet. He was a compassionate prophet, a prophet that you and I can trust. Well, what kind of Savior was God? Obviously, He was a good Savior. He took upon Himself your sin, your shame, your guilt, feelings of condemnation, and He paid for the penalty of your sins. While we were yet sinners, wicked, and ungodly, He demonstrated His agape love towards us. So He's a, a good Savior, a compassionate Savior, a loving Savior, one that you and I can trust. Well, what kind of high priest is God? Isn't He a good one? Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 4 reveals to us that He's merciful, that He's gracious, and He's sympathetic. And He invites you and I to come to His throne of grace where we can expect to find mercy and grace in our time of need. So He's a good high priest, isn't He? And according to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, He is able to save to the uttermost to those that come unto God through Him. That's good news. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've been. God is able to save to the uttermost. And what kind of judge is God? I mentioned I had a friend that I met by the name of Trey. A friend introduced me to him through the phone, and so he calls and texts every week, and we dialogue with each other. And so one day he sent me a text saying, I don't really understand this verse in the book of Amos. Justice was given outside the gate. So having learned in seminary, the importance of letting the Bible interpret itself, what happened outside the gate? Well, anytime there was a dispute within a city, the two parties or the two factions, the two individuals would go outside the city gate and the elders would meet with them and the elders would listen to the evidence being presented on both sides. And then they would either give a judgment of acquittal or judgment of condemnation. Someone would be found guilty, another person would be found what? Innocent. So justice was given outside the gate. Well, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 said, Jesus suffered for us, where? Outside the gate. So justice was given for you and me outside the gate. Why? Because we have an enemy that accuses us day and night. He knows all our weaknesses. He knows all our time out. So as I mentioned, justice was given outside the gate. Jesus paid for the penalty of your sins and my sins. Isn't that good to know? So what kind of judge do we have? Well, Daniel chapter 7 reveals to us that Jesus, as our judge, gives us the verdict of acquittal, judgment in favor of the saints, as long as we put our confidence in Him. Isn't that good news? Well, what kind of king is He? When He was here on earth, Jesus made an astounding statement. He said, whoever is chief among you, let him be your what? Be your what? your servant. So we have an interesting story recorded in John chapter 13. Jesus is with his disciples. They are in this upper room and Jesus puts an apron around his waist. Then he begins to wash the dirty feet of his disciples. So what kind of ruler, what kind of king is Jesus? He comes to serve His creation. That should touch our lives. So when we get to heaven, guess what? Jesus will reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, and He will serve you and me for all eternity. This was not some Hollywood production that, that um, heaven put on when Jesus came to this earth. So what kind of king is he? He's a good king. He's a compassionate king, a loving king, one that you and I can trust. Does that make sense? 
Because when Jesus comes the second time, He comes as King of kings and Lord of lords, and He comes to serve His creation. So to understand what kind of king Jesus is, you have to understand what kind of creator was Jesus. And to understand what kind of creator Jesus was, you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of prophet was he? And after you answer that question, then you have to ask yourself another question. Well, what kind of savior, what kind of high priest, and what kind of judge, what kind of king? So the kingdom of heaven is like... The kingdom of heaven denotes that there is a king, there is a ruler. Then last Sabbath, we looked at the essence of the kingdom. And what was the essence of the kingdom? It was revealed on the cross of Calvary, self-sacrificing love for the upbuilding of humanity. We looked at the story of Captain Naaman. He was a leper. He was dying from that mycobacterium. And as the, the army of Syria invaded the land of Israel, there was a young girl taken as a captive. And she was in the home of Captain Naaman, working for Captain Naaman's wife. And one day she saw that Captain Naaman's wife was crying. Well, what's wrong? Well, my husband has leprosy. And remember what that young lady shared? with Mrs. Naaman, oh, hey, listen, we have a prophet in Israel. And I know that that prophet, the prophet's name was what? Elisha. He can help your husband. I know he can, because he has a, a special connection with God. And so Captain Naaman went to the home of Elisha. And he expected that Elisha would come out and heal him instantly of his leprosy. But he told him something very interesting. You need to go down to the Jordan River, and you need to dip under the water seven times. Now, what do we know about the Jordan River? It was very dirty and, and muddy. It was not a clean river. So he was upset. He said, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's too degrading. It's too humiliating. So he began his journey with his servants back to his, the leper colony where he was living. He said, you know, at least Elisha could have told me to, to, to dip in the Farpar River or the Abana River. They were clean. They were known for having clean water. Well, one of the servants said, hey, listen, if, if he told you to do something great, you would have done it. Why don't you just humble your proud heart and go into the Jordan River and dip down seven times? You'll be healed of your leprosy. Leprosy, what do you have to lose? And so what did he do? He waded into that muddy river and he dipped down how many times? Seven times. And when he came up the seventh time, his leprosy was gone. Then I had mentioned in the sermon, what does the name Jordan mean? Remember that? What does it mean? The descender. And it comes from another Hebrew word that means to descend. So the only one that can cleanse us from our sins is the one who descended from heaven. And Jesus was the great descender. And he uh, took upon himself our sin, our shame, our guilt, our condemnation, and became filthy and muddy and dirty for us in order that he might cleanse us. So that's symbolic of the work of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Self-sacrificing love for the uplifting of his family, his children. Well, today we're going to look at the king and his law. A ruler has a kingdom, and a kingdom is made up of subjects. And the subjects of the kingdom are governed by law. So far, so good? And the law must be based on love and respect. Without love and respect, no kingdom can stand. Just think about Saddam Hussein. Did he have a kingdom? Was he a ruler? Did he have laws to govern his people? Yes, he did. But did Saddam Hussein govern his people 
through love and respect. So a ruler has a kingdom, and a kingdom is made up of subjects, and the subjects of the kingdom are governed by law. And the law must be based on two things, love and respect. Without love and respect, no kingdom can stand. For a kingdom to survive, the people must be convinced that their ruler loves them and respects their freedom of choice. And they must be convinced that the law of their ruler is based upon the principle of love and respect. And if the people believe this truth, if the people believe this truth, they will submit humbly to the authority of their ruler. And they will gladly obey the laws that govern the land. But if the ruler has no genuine love or respect for his subjects, for his people, the nation will fall apart. And as I mentioned, think about Saddam Hussein. Did he love his people? Did he respect their freedom of choice? No, he didn't care about them. It was all about power. It was all about power. So if a ruler has no genuine love and respect for his subjects, the nation will fall apart, his kingdom will collapse, and the people of the kingdom will rise up against their ruler and depose him. Do we not find this in the word of God? When a, when a, a, a bad ruler rose to power, and had no love or respect for his people, what happened in Bible history? The people would rise up against their ruler and depose him. There was anarchy, there was war, there was bloodshed. Listen, without love and respect, a marriage will end in divorce. Without love and respect, a family will fall apart. Without love and respect, a society will crumble. What is going on in the major cities in the United States of America. Do people have love and respect for others? No, there's no love, there's no respect. The ugly monster called rebellion will arise. Without love and respect, anarchy will fill the land. Without love and respect, civil war is inevitable. Think about the civil war that, that occurred within our nation. Didn't we have a civil war? Why? Because the South did not love or respect a certain group of people because their color was different than theirs. No love, no respect. A ruler who has no love and respect for his subjects creates an atmosphere of rebellion in his realm. And people who are void of love and respect for authority will trample on the rights and freedoms of others. They will seek to overthrow all authority except the authority of those who lead them into a state of anarchy and rebellion. Any form of rebellion against authority, authority that is based on love and respect, is rebellion against law and order. And any form of rebellion against law and order is rebellion against the principle of love and respect. And any form of rebellion against the principle of love and respect is rebellion against the very foundation of the ruler's authority. And open rebellion always leads, listen carefully, to looting, stealing, and killing. Open rebellion leads to what? Looting, stealing, and killing. Don't we find that in Bible history? Don't we find that in secular history? We do. It always leads to looting, stealing, killing, and we could add rape. So this morning, I would like to look at the foundation of God's throne, the foundation of His kingdom. I would like to see how He rules the universe. 
Finally, I would like to look at the subjects of God's kingdom. So let's begin by looking at the foundation of God's government. If you have your Bible at this time, I invite you to turn to Psalm 89, verse 14. Psalm 89, verse 14. Psalm 89, verse 14, the Word of God says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Psalm 97, verse 2, clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Proverbs 16, verse 12, It is an abomination for king, uh, kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. Proverbs 25, verse 5, Take away the wicked from the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Now, from these verses, we learn that the foundation of God's throne is what? What is the th uh, foundation of God's throne? Righteousness. Now, since the foundation of His throne is righteousness, He must rule His kingdom in righteousness and through righteousness. Doesn't that make sense? Therefore, if God has the throne, which he does, he must have a kingdom, which he does. And if he has a kingdom, he must have subjects that he rules. So how does God, who sits on his throne in heaven, rule his subjects that are found within his kingdom? Psalm 45, verse 6 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. So what have we learned so far? God is a ruler. And as a ruler, he sits on a throne, and his throne is located in heaven, and he governs his creation from his throne. And what is the foundation of his throne? Righteousness. And from his throne, he rules his creation with a scepter of righteousness. Thus, God's throne and his scepter reveals his nature and his character. Psalm 119, verse 142. You have to see this with your own eyes. Psalm 119, verse 142. The Word of God says in Psalm 119, verse 142, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. <clears throat> By the way, this is kind of something off the cuff. But there are certain Christians, there are certain people that believe that Jesus had a beginning. Way back in the days of eternity, he came from the bosom of the Father, whatever that means. But how does that impact the whole plan of salvation if Jesus had a beginning sometime way, 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 way back in the days of eternity? How does that impact his sacrifice on the cross to atone for your sin and mine? Well, Psalm 119 says God possesses what kind of, ever, uh, what kind of righteousness? Everlasting righteousness. Verse uh, 119, verse 172, it says, Your commandments are righteousness. So if the commandments are righteousness and God possesses everlasting righteousness, then the law of God demands payment from someone who possesses everlasting righteousness. That's why it's so important for you and I to understand the divine nature of Jesus Christ. He never had a beginning, and he never will have an ending. He is the divine Son of God that has existed for all eternity. Why? 
because he possesses everlasting righteousness. And what defines righteousness? God's law. So then the law of God demands payment from someone possessing what kind of righteousness? Everlasting righteousness. That's why it's so important for you and I to understand the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is the truth. Now let's summarize what we've learned so far. God is a ruler. True or false? True. He's a king and as a ruler he sits on a throne and his throne is located in heaven. And the foundation of his throne is righteousness. He rules the entire universe through principles of righteousness. And he rules with a scepter we learned of righteousness. And the scepter of righteousness reveals the truth about his character. It reveals how he thinks, how he feels, how he operates among his creation and interacts with them. So to rule in righteousness, one must be what? If you are to rule in righteousness, you must be what? You must be righteous. To govern people in righteousness, you must be righteous. And to lead people to righteousness, you must be righteous. And the Bible reveals to us that God is righteous. He always has been and He always will be. Now Psalm 119 verse 142 again, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is the truth. So how do you know what righteousness is? How do I know what righteousness is? Psalm 119 verse 172, I mentioned it to you, My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are what? Righteousness. Therefore, God's commandments define, or, yeah, God's commandments define to you and me what righteousness is. They reveal what righteousness looks like. And how does Paul summarize God's commandments? Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. Romans chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandment, I'm sorry, for the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Now you remember the story when a Pharisee came to Jesus and he asked him a question and he was simply testing him. He said, what is the greatest commandment in the Torah, the five books of Moses? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as what? As yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what is God? God is a king. He's a ruler. And what does he rule? He rules a kingdom. And what makes up his kingdom? His subjects. And what kind of king is God? We discovered he's a righteous king. And how does he rule his universe? He rules his universe in righteousness. And what defines righteousness? His law. And what is his law based on? Two things. Love and respect. 
Every one of the commandments is based on love and respect. Like, for example, the commandment that says, thou shalt not steal. Now, we have a neighbor, a, a lady that moved right across the street from us. Her name is Meg, and she was on a, a vacation. She was gone for a while. Now, if I love and respect my new neighbor, I will not yield to the temptation of wanting to break into her garage and her home in steel things that do not belong to me. Does that make sense? Every one of the commandments is based on these two principles, love and respect. So we have anarchy in our world today, and we have anarchy in the major cities. People have no respect for authority, right? Therefore, we have looting, stealing, and killing. No respect for authority. Why? There's no love. There's no love. Genuine love. So I, let me kind of go over this again. If you love your neighbor, you will respect their property. If you love your neighbor, you will respect their life. If you love your neighbor, you will respect their marriage. You will not try to interfere. Healthy relationships are built on love and respect. And the same goes for our relationship with Jesus. If you love him, you will respect him by keeping his seventh day Sabbath holy. If you love him, you will respect him by not taking his name in vain. Now let's see how the creation of heaven and earth showed love and respect for his creation. So I'm going to build a foundation. I want you to, to follow my train of thought. Jesus came to reveal to you and I what the Father was like in character. John chapter 1, verse 18. He came to magnify. He came to exalt. He came to reveal the truth about the character of God. Psalm 40, verse 8. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is where? Within my heart. This is a messianic psalm, and it points to Jesus. And his mission was to what? to magnify the law. But to magnify the law, the law had to be written within his heart. Isaiah 42, verse 21, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. And then I think Bill mentioned in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to what? To fulfill. So we see the relationship of the king to his law. He came to reveal the truth about the kingdom of heaven, what his father was like, and how his father governs his universe. And the foundation of his throne is righteousness. And righteousness is defined by his law, and the law reveals to us two principles, love and respect. Do you know that God loves you? Do you know that he respects your freedom of choice? That is, that's how he governs the universe. We all have the freedom of choice, and we know what happened way back in the days of eternity when God created a covering chair by the name of Lucifer. He was given the freedom of choice. He could choose to love God, he could choose to serve God, or he could choose not to love God and not to serve him. Well, one day a thought entered his mind. How that thought entered his mind, we do not know. It's called the mystery of iniquity. But because God respected his freedom of choice, what happened? Rebellion and anarchy occurred in heaven, and he deceived a third of the angels. So believe it or not, God's moral law is based on what? Love and respect. We knew about love, right? 
But did you know that it's based on respect for another person's freedom of choice? Love and respect. Well, let's look at the... Um, Let's look at uh, some medieval history. After the apostles passed away, the church fell into the hands of the church fathers, and they were of Greek descent. They placed human reason above divine revelation. And as a result, the mystery of iniquity arose. The man of sin, the son of perdition. Now, the Apostle Paul reveals to us how the mystery of iniquity, the man of sin, the son of perdition, arose, began to form in his day and age. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by the word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless... What? There come a falling away first. The Greek word for falling away is apostasia, which means there has to be an apostasy before the coming of Christ. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of what? Sin. And how does the Bible define sin? the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. So there would be this, this, this system arising. It began to arise when Paul was here on earth. And he warned the members of the church of Corinth that, listen, Jesus is not going to come the second time unless an apostasy occurs within the church. There's going to be this system, this man, He's going to be the man of sin, the son of perdition. Now that phrase, son of perdition, is only used one other time, and it's found in John chapter 17. And that phrase originally was given to one of the disciples of Jesus. Jesus. And who was that disciple? Judas. And why was he called the son of perdition? Because he had a love for two things, money and and power. He believed that the Messiah would come as a conquering king, sit on a throne, and all of Israel would suddenly become prosperous, live in nice homes, have plenty of food to eat, and plenty of gold and silver to buy whatever they wanted. Does that make sense? So he's called the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits in the temple of God. Now, God has a throne, and his throne is located where? In heaven. And what is the foundation of his throne? Righteousness. So Satan would work through a system called the papacy, and he would exalt a man, and that man would be called what? The man of sin, the son of perdition, and he would be known for lawlessness. So he, the foundation of his throne is, guess what? Unrighteousness. Two thrones, two rulers. Continuing on, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time for the mystery of lawlessness. For the mystery of what? lawlessness is already at work. And then I could continue on, but I'm, I'm not going to. So was there a religious political system that arose during the Dark Ages that would be lawless? Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. He, the little horn power, shall speak pompous words against the Most High, 
shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Change times and what? And what is the foundation of God's throne in heaven? How does he govern? How does he rule the vast universe? In righteousness. And what defines righteousness? Psalm 119, verse 172. All your commandments are what? Righteousness. So the devil would be working through a system at the end of time. There would be a man sitting on, the, on a throne. And what would be the foundation of his throne? lawlessness, unrighteousness. Why? Because he would think that he could change God's law and his day of worship. Are you following? Idolatry came into the Christian church. And if you read the Old Testament scriptures, anytime ancient Israel succumbed to the temptation of idol idolatry, adultery, and the most vile sins came into the church. Are you tracking with me? But isn't it interesting that John and Vision saw a group of people at the end of time prior to the second coming that would not buy into this lawless theology? Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, And the dragon, that would be Satan, was enraged with the woman, God's church, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, or the remnant, which do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And who are those that enter into the pearly gates or through the pearly gates into the holy city? Revelation chapter 22, verse 14 and 15. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. So who are those that have the privilege of entering into the holy city? Those who are living in harmony with God's moral law. Now here's the big question. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, All our righteousness is what? Filthy rags. We have no righteousness in and of ourselves. Now we know we have a ruler that governs the entire universe in righteousness. And the foundation of his throne is righteousness. And he is righteous. And he wants you and I to be the subjects of this kingdom. But we possess no what? We possess no righteousness in and of ourselves. For all have sinned, and all continually fall short of the glory of God. So how then can we become subjects to his kingdom and have the privilege of entering through the gates into the holy city? Righteousness comes by faith in the man Christ Jesus. According to Romans chapter 3, God gives us his very own righteousness. Not only his imputed righteousness, but his imparted righteousness. And if we choose to receive Jesus into our hearts by faith alone, then the righteousness of God comes into our hearts. And if the righteousness of God is in our hearts, guess what? We're going to love people as Jesus loved people, and we're going to respect people as Jesus respected people. Does that make sense? Because love and respect is the very foundation of God's government. So what is the remedy to the anarchy that we find in the world in which we live? First of all, people have to know that what they're doing is wrong. The law of God has to speak to their conscience, and the Holy Spirit needs to speak to their hearts. That you are a sinner in a lost condition, and you cannot save yourself. But there is good news. God sent us 
that wonderful gift in His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. And if you embrace that gift by faith alone, the righteousness of God will come into your heart. And you then will become one of His subjects. And you will live a morally upright life, not to earn God's love, not to earn salvation, but you will live a morally upright life to honor and glorify your King and ruler. Righteousness is by faith alone. And so at the end of time, we're told in, in uh, Revelation chapter 17, or 7, that the, the angels, there are four of them, they're standing on the corners of the earth. And what are they holding back? The winds of strife. Until what? Until God's people receive the seal of the living God. And the seal of the living God is revealed in Isaiah, I believe, chapter 8, verse 16. Seal the law among my disciples. So God's seal is his law that he writes within our hearts and minds. So in vision, John saw at the end of time prior to the second coming, there would be two groups of people one group would promote rebellion, and the other group would prom promote righteousness. And to promote righteousness, to preach righteousness, we must be righteous. And the only way that you and I can be righteous is if Jesus is allowed to set up his throne in our hearts and live out his life within us. Well, may God bless you as you contemplate his word today. Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for everyone that has come out to, to hear the word of God proclaimed. Lord, we live in a very interesting world. There is so much violence and and and, and bad things that are going on. But Lord, you are... A wonderful king. What kind of king are you? We've contemplated what king, kind of creator were you? What kind of prophet were you? What kind of savior were you? What kind of high priest are you? And what kind of judge are you? And once we answer these questions, Lord, there's only one thing that remains. And that is a very important decision that everyone has to make. Will we allow you to come into our hearts and set up your throne there? And so it's my hope and prayer that everyone here this morning will allow you to come into their hearts and set up, their, set up your throne because you are a ruler of righteousness. And Lord, we need to respect authority. We need to respect the laws that, that govern um, our land. And so we are yours by creation. We are yours by redemption. And we give you that permission in Jesus' name. Amen.